Welcome. Welcome to Sage for This Age, your place in cyberspace where we search for truth and meaning in global politics. And welcome to another episode of the IR Theory interview series. My name is Jon Obey, and I am a senior lecturer in the Department of Global Political Studies at Malmö University. In this interview series, I interview IR scholars about their preferred theoretical perspectives. The idea is to get a brief account of why scholars appreciate a certain IR theory through a short interview. Today, I have the honor to interview John Eikenberry, probably the most prominent liberal IR scholar in the world. Welcome, Professor Eikenberry. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for participating. So before we start uh, uh, with the questions concerning liberal IR concepts and so on, uh, would you please tell us a little bit about your scholarly background? Yes, uh, John. Um, well, it, it, it began really in graduate school at the University of Chicago, where I studied international relations and political science. Um, I began an interest uh, uh, in international relations through debates about the state, uh, uh, what, are, what are states, how do they act in interna international relations. I've spent uh, most of my career at Princeton University, where beginning in the, uh, uh, really the period at the end of the Cold War into this current period, I've been very much interested in the, the grand debates in international relations, the rise and decline of, of states, the, the uh, uh, questions of hegemonic order, the building of order after major wars, which was the subject of my book, After Victory, mm -hmm. the American era, the Pax Americana, what is the logic of the American system? Is it an mm -hmm. empire or is it something more? Mm -hmm. uh, is it something less? Uh, uh, and, and then more recently, uh, I've been turning to uh, quite directly, uh, uh, really an account of the ideas that are behind uh, uh, what the term that we use, liberal internationalism, and mm -hmm. the project of building order around those ideas, which we call liberal international order. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's been a, a kind of an arc of, of scholarly inquiry bringing mm -hmm. us to today's, today's moment. Okay, interesting. So you started at the University of Chicago, but now you are at... Princeton University. Princeton University. Yeah. And uh, Princeton has been uh, for decades, really, uh, one of the, the leading schools uh, for the study of international relations. Uh, mm -hmm. It has had, since the early Cold War period, one of the centers for international studies. It publishes the journal uh, World Politics. Mm -hmm. And over the decades, it's had a very distinguished faculty uh, from uh, different uh, a theoretical perspectives. The, uh, the famous uh, realist uh, uh, Bob uh, uh, Gilpin mm -hmm. uh, and the, the famous uh, normative global thinker Richard Falk and mm -hmm. many others in between, mm -hmm. Michael Doyle mm -hmm. and many others. So it's, it's been a kind of hub for, for, for IR theory. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that uh, background. Uh, so, let's get down to business. Uh, if you are to choose two or three core liberal IR concepts you have worked with, uh, which ones would you choose and why? Well, I think that um, you have to start with the basic core of, of what liberal internationalism is and then break it down. Liberal internationalism is a, a family of ideas that really have emerged with the rise of of democracy itself, of liberal democracy in the, the age of, uh, of democratic revolutions in the late 18th century and then the early 19th century, the rise of liberal democracy, the, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the, um, the uh, uh, era of the rise of liberal democratic states in the, uh, in the West, and the ideas that have uh, been generated by uh, internationalists within those countries about uh, how to build international uh, order. In the 19th century, a, a whole family of internationalisms, mm. the peace movement, the free trade movement, uh, arbitration, uh, international law, social policy that has uh, uh, been uh, uh, debated and promoted across borders in the industrial world uh, into the 20th century. The the body of ideas that really came together as a tradition of thinking, I think, in the early 20th century, 
uh, in, include uh, uh, at least four, you might call them convictions or core uh, ideas hmm. that uh, distinguish and separate uh, liberal internationalism from alternative uh, 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 grand traditions of thought such as realism and Marxism. And uh, these are number one, uh, the, the view that openness uh, uh, and exchange is something that involves, uh, that, that has benefits for, for uh, all parties concerned properly managed. So the uh, open trade, open spaces, uh, countries having access to each other, exchange and so forth. Secondly, that international institutions, um, uh, everything else being equal, facilitate international cooperation in various ways that scholars of international relations uh, study. And thirdly, that liberal democracies are unusually capable of cooperating with each other um, uh, because of shared values, because of shared interests, and because of, of, of the ability to uh, uh, to connect with each other, to make commitments, and to pursue uh, 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 collaborative exercises over time and space uh, uh, as, as, as something that really distinguishes them uh, uh, in the wider global arena. And then finally, and in many ways most importantly, uh, liberal internationalists uh, um, have a conviction that in a world of rising economic security, political, and environmental interdependence, uh, um, countries, particularly liberal states, uh, have a strong interest in, in cooperation. Or to put it uh, differently, under conditions of rising interdependence, the costs of lost autonomy associated with making binding commitments to other states is less than the gains that are experienced through the coordination of your policies. Mm. So there's a kind of logic of cooperation that comes from interdependence. Mm. And that interdependence is theorized by liberals, as, as we may want to discuss, uh, as it is uh, manifest through uh, modernity, through mm. science, technology, uh, industrialism, and mm. the uh, uh, ongoing global mobilization of human society. Mm. And under those conditions, liberal internationalists argue because of, of their, uh, the, the value associated with openness, with institutions, uh, with democracy itself as a value, uh, these countries uh, have a distinctive, vibrant uh, 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 a set of, uh, of, of ideas and practices that animate them on the global stage. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that uh, elaboration. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, if, I, if I can ask a follow-up question in relation to what you just mentioned. I mean, you mentioned uh, openness, uh, institutions, liberal democracies being uh, uh, successful in cooperating and then interdependence, uh, those four core uh, factors, so to speak. Um, but I mean, if we consider the world today, uh, if we consider the US-China trade and technology war, the crisis of the WTO appellate body, the dispute settlement mechanism, the COVID pandemic, the rise of authoritarianism, some would even talk about a, a third reverse wave of de-democratization. Um, is it not tough being a liberal these days? <laughs> <laughs> well, you certainly, uh, uh, we are in a world where, where we probably need more liberal internationalism, not less of it. And uh, we certainly are also at a moment where uh, there is a, a, a kind of world historical pause where we reflect on what, what, uh, what kind of order we are living in and where we are going. And, and uh, to the extent we have agency uh, in creating uh, the world we live in, what kind of world would we like to, to build? Um, I think that when uh, any theorist uh, thinks about the world, uh, you, the first question to some extent is, or what are the animating values that, uh, that um, you think are at the heart of the project of, mm -hmm. that, you, that you're, you're, you're involved in, that you're theorizing? Liberal internationalists, uh, like their, their political theory cousins, uh, liberals, uh, 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 start with a set of values, uh, you might say, uh, 
uh, Human Liberty, a Locke Second Treatise. You get a whole body of ideas that come out of the, the liberal democratic experience and the ascendancy of these states. And you seek to uh, theorize about the prospects of these polities. Uh, think about um, the, the world uh, over the last 200 years, moving from one where uh, these kinds of regimes uh, really didn't exist uh, uh, before the, the 19th century. You had uh, monarchs and autocratic states and uh, em empires of one kind or another, but, but as the world became more populated by liberal democracies, you saw new types of, of patterns of activity, new uh, projects, new uh, forms of interdependence, new imaginaries about how the world could be organized. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that 200 year period, we'll call it the liberal ascendancy, there have been ups and downs. There have been crises and there have been golden eras. There have been the reinventions. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, as we talk, John, about today's impasse, today's uh, tough times for liberals, as you mentioned, uh, we should probably look back and, and appreciate the the earlier periods when similar kinds of moments arrived, uh, the 1930s and early 40s, mm -hmm. that was a moment when uh, the whole project of liberal democracy, of this kind of species of state mm -hmm. in a larger population of very different states, fascist, totalitarian, and so forth, mm -hmm. were, were very much up for grabs, a kind of extinction moment. What, seven democracies were left in the world? And thinking about how um, uh, uh, these countries operated, what, what were the sources of, of their rebuilding after World War II uh, in the face of, of all of these um, illiberal forces, total war, the Great Depression, mm -hmm. the Holocaust, uh, the dropping of the atomic bomb. And mm -hmm. yet these societies, uh, uh, such as they were in 1945, picked up the pieces and reimagined open societies in a relatively open world. Mm -hmm. And I would submit to you that that is the most demanding kind of international order the world has ever seen, an open societies operating in an open international system. Mm -hmm. uh, the complexity of achieving a st stability and a kind of functionality uh, in the face of backlash and, and, uh, and uh, um, dynamics that uh, uh, work against uh, those those kinds of systems is extraordinary, and yet there was this kind of long era, and I think that that uh, is a, is something that we continue to need to study, to theorize, to mm -hmm. extract lessons, develop a kind of usable past, uh, looking back to to guide uh, the current era of rebuilding, reinventing uh, uh, liberal uh, internationalism. Mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. Um, I hear um, more or less two uh, claims that liberalism is still valid as a normative aspiration, as an ideology, uh, as a set of values, they are superior. Um, and then I hear another claim um, that um, if we compare um, today's world with the past, today's world is still much more liberal than the past and we have still made progress. Um, is, is that correct? Well, to, sum I guess to summarize it very briefly. I guess the, 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 the broader point is that there have always been ups and downs, that mm -hmm. there have been, there's been progress, there's been two steps forward, one step back, but mm -hmm. that the, it's not so much that there is, uh, we're, we're, we're better than we used to be, that would not be my message, it would be <laughs> that, that, that liberal democracies are more vulnerable than probably was appreciated after the end of the Cold War when it looked like it was the only, only kind of uh, polity uh, that uh, had survived the, the 20th century, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the era in which everything else seemed to fall away. Mm -hmm. that, that in fact, uh, they are much more precious, they are more uh, 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 fragile, vulnerable kinds of polities. That's actually something that theorists have told us time and time again across the centuries, that mm -hmm. so-called republics are, mm -hmm. are, are, are very vulnerable to uh, uh, power politics, uh, mm -hmm. undermining the, their, 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 uh, uh, their institutions, which are, are, are meant to constrain power, not to aggregate power. And so they are vulnerable in a larger, uh, uh, rapacious uh, geopolitical environment. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so we, we know that there is a kind of uh, a vulnerability to this kind of kind of state and that that there, therefore there is always a kind of uh, ongoing uh, um, uh, struggle to to solve problems to find ways for for state these states to cooperate uh, this is what I see see when I look back at at at, at uh, liberal democracies in a wider world that there is this ongoing recurring uh, 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 one might say agonistic uh, to use the Greek term for struggle agonistic story it's not one of of continual march to victory and progress mm -hmm. uh, it's more of of ups and downs, of steps forward and steps back, and learning and redoubling your efforts. Would it be correct then just to um, uh, continue focusing on something you just mentioned, um, to say that you do not really believe in the linearity of liberalism, uh, in the sense of liberalism having uh, yeah, some kind of commitment to a, a linear historical development that is teleological in a sense uh, since you mentioned these ups and downs which more or less is uh, characteristic of realism's understanding of a cyclical history yes and, and that's a center central insight of the book i've just written mm. which is trying to extract liberal internationalism as a as a set of ideas and projects for thinking about and acting in the world. So liberal internationalism as a, as a set of ideas and projects from specific states in particular moments of history. So mm -hmm. I want to, to, to and so a particular move in this book is, 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 is not simply to say liberal internationalism is whatever the United States does yeah. or whatever Britain does or yeah. whatever the Western states do. It's actually a set of ideas that, that in some ways uh, connect and in other ways disconnect from the real world mm. and that those ideas and those projects and the agents who take up liberal internationalism in the real world as opposed to theorists like me who study liberals and liberal ideas mm -hmm. they are in a world uh, with with all sorts of clashing uh, uh, forces uh, that are shaping the the terrain for contestation over mm -hmm. international order. Think mm -hmm. of what those are mm -hmm. from the 19th century to the 20th century. Uh, you see the rise of nationalism. It was really mm -hmm. uh, uh, invented in the, 19, uh, in, the, in the 19th century, uh, along with internationalism as kind of uh, 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 projects, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 empire and imperialism, mm -hmm. uh, uh, liberal democracies were born in a world of empire. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, capitalism, mm. uh, uh, great power politics, and um, ongoing uh, shifts in, in hegemonic power across the world. Mm -hmm. So that is a world that is not uh, simply marching to the tune of liberal internationalism. In fact, as I argue in the book, liberal internationalism is kind of a weak force in world history in the sense mm. that that it's a it's a flag without an army. It's not there. You don't see people out in the streets uh, marching in favor of liberal internationalism. It's a set of ideas that get attached to other projects and are, are tied to larger movements uh, in history, really with the rise of, of, of industrial societies and with liberal democracy itself. You start to get these forces that liberal internationalism, uh, as we've been talking about it, begin to, to, to become manifest and used in, in all sorts of ways, sometimes used as ends in themselves. Think of the Cold War. Some saw the uh, spreading of a kind of liberal international order as, a, as an objective uh, that was to be valued in and of itself, while others fighting the Cold War with the Soviet Union for realist reasons, balancing reasons, mm -hmm. uh, saw liberal internationalism as a, as a means, not an end. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, very, that's very much the pattern that um, it gets fit into lots of different projects and it goes forward or it goes backwards mm -hmm. based on the la larger aggregation mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of the great forces that have been uh, shaping the modern system. Mm -hmm. but, but, but you would still say Despite this, uh, despite this reflection, despite this criticism, despite this um, 
uh, transparency in terms of the flawed uh, aspects of, of liberalism and its uh, historical hiccup and so on. Uh, or, or hiccup, I mean, yeah, the, the forces um, throughout history where we see that uh, there is some um, back and forth movement in terms of uh, liberalism being very weak in certain periods and then it becomes stronger and then perhaps weaker again and that liberalism might even be a weak uh, force in today's world. Uh, so despite this uh, self-reflection really given that you you are uh, uh, a core liberal IR scholar, um, would you still claim that IR liberalism uh, or liberal IR reflect, uh, or um, sorry, uh, explain state behavior the best? Well, I think the, the, the answer to that question is that liberal internationalism makes sense in a world of liberal democracies. Mm. And if we are uh, uh, moving into a world where those, uh, uh, those kinds of states decline, you aren't going to see liberal internationalism, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it really is a kind of less um, grand and universalistic uh, uh, way of looking at the world mm -hmm. than some of the others that are, are on offer because it really is tied to, to, to a type of regime, a type of polity that, is, uh, that has become uh, uh, present in this modern era and uh, its fate, liberal internationalism, uh, will rise and decline uh, as liberal democracies rise and decline. So, mm -hmm. so the answer really is um, uh, it's dependent on other uh, forces in history and the kind of conditions. Uh, uh, I don't think liberal internationalism necessarily is a useful way of exploring uh, the, the Greek, the classical Greek state system or uh, ancient China or large uh, periods of, of, uh, of world history uh, tied to uh, both regional and global empire. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is in that sense a more limited uh, uh, view of the world tied to, to, uh, to a particular type of politics mm. uh, that, uh, that, that it both informs and uh, is built upon. Mm. Okay, and then and given the close connection to, to liberal democracies, of course, and a particular type of regime, um, what would you then make of the critique um, that some are raising against liberalism, that there is an expansionist, interventionist, even imperialist dimension uh, to uh, liberal internationalism uh, that is not so benign? Yeah, I, I guess... As, as a theorist, my position would be, and I explore this in great detail in the book, because I do think the connection between liberalism and empire and the connection between liberalism and military interventionism in the most recent period mm. is a, a hot topic, is, mm. is, 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 is definitely fraught, a uh, fraught issue and one that uh, has real world political consequences. So mm -hmm. what, what is liberalism's relationship and liberal internationalism's relationship to empire and interventionism? Mm -hmm. uh, my position, I think, is pretty clear. It's, it's a contingent relationship. Mm -hmm. Liberals have been on both sides of the empire debate. You have had liberals and liberal internationalists who have been uh, uh, champions of, of empire for mm -hmm. liberal reasons, the, the, you know, the civilizational, civilizing kind of thesis of the 19th century, think of John Stuart Mill, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but equally salient have been uh, uh, liberals who have been anti-imperial mm -hmm. and have seen uh, empire as, as a, the great corruption mm -hmm. of, of, of liberalism. And indeed, to the extent liberalism has a core value of, 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 of uh, the value of human uh, liberty, mm -hmm. uh, it, it has a kind of implicit uh, um, uh, 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 um, uh, value of, of liberation, of, mm -hmm. of emancipation, really. And, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, the U.S. Uh, began its career as a, as a nation uh, uh, as, as, as one, of the, one of the first, uh, first uh, 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 liberal democracies uh, in its very uh, infant for formation. Uh, 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 separated itself from empire. It was mm -hmm. a rebellion against the British Empire. So the liberalism, liberal democracy has, has been 
uh, uh, used and and abused for for many many different purposes. I don't think it's inherently imperial, and indeed it's contingent. And the fact that so many liberals have found themselves as as champions of anti imperialism and have and decolonialization and liberals not just in the west but in the non-west have seen their own projects informed by values of self-determination and we the people uh, there is a kind of uh, a complexity to the interconnections that uh, defy a kind of simple branding of well, it's just empire mm -hmm. with a happy face. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, th I think, uh, I, I think the, the debate goes on. But I, I think that's a that position is is one that that um, that, that that I found uh, quite quite uh, compelling as I mm -hmm. sort through uh, the the long record mm -hmm. of liberal democracy and international relations. Mm. Thank you very much for that uh, elaboration. Uh, so. Um, Let's move on uh, with the last questions. Um, first, uh, in terms of uh, policy relevance, uh, how would liberal IR inform policy? M many of those things perhaps have already been said and touched upon, but. Well, it's a great question. Um, I, I, there's a lot you could say. I, I, I think um, liberal internationalists in the period since World War II have a, a, a something to offer today's today's policymakers uh, 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 various uh, leaders of liberal democracies today are struggling for sure there is on the horizon uh, uh, China as as a rising state that, that that does not wish liberal democracy well it's, it's really a rival in many ways to to the Western liberal uh, vision of modernity mm -hmm. uh, uh, so so uh, I think the the, the most uh, important lesson or guidance that might come to current leaders in liberal democracies is to look to that past, to 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 acknowledge the failures, uh, the the disappointments, the 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 the, uh, the 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 moral blind blindness that often comes from real world uh, states uh, 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 wielding liberal ideas, but to also look for those uh, great accomplishments. And after World War II, I think you do have the great moment when liberal democracies created a new kind of order um, uh, built around uh, institutions and forms of cooperation that uh, in one way or another created a kind of world system, a kind of system of of, of, of institutions and partnerships and bargains uh, that allowed states of all different uh, sorts, but starting with liberal democracies to come together and find common cause and uh, safeguard their, their societies and move forward. Um, think about how Germany and Japan went from being fascist states to being the second and large and uh, third largest uh, uh, economies in the world, mm -hmm. tying themselves to this yeah this uh, democratic space, think about the European Union mm. uh, with France and Germany binding themselves together, which is a, a profoundly liberal form of statecraft, binding, mm -hmm. binding together two countries that had been at war with each other three times in 70 years, mm. creating a project of union. Yeah. Um, think about the way in which the institutions of the modern world, a plethora of multilateral institutions, global and regional, economic, security, political, human rights, environmental, extraordinary uh, weaving together of an international society driven by liberal democracies, but not limited to them, mm -hmm. creating a kind of uh, a space, a kind of ecosystem, mm -hmm. a kind of environment in which these countries could, could, could thrive and integrate additional countries that were making various kinds of political and economic trans transitions, particularly after the Cold War, but you're really starting in the 80s, uh, mm -hmm. South Korea, East Asian states, mm -hmm. Latin America, uh, Eastern European, Southern European, states around the world have found uh, uh, opportunities 
it's not always easy, but find opportunities to integrate themselves into this uh, transnational complex mm. uh, that we call liberal international order. Um, and that uh, is what current leaders, I think, might look back on and try to, uh, to preserve what's left of it, mm. to, to deepen what they can of it, mm -hmm. to reform it so that it's more legitimate, and to make it functional for what I think is the, the greatest uh, danger of this, uh, this uh, current liberal international period is the, the failure to address the problems of real people living real lives, mm -hmm. everyday people living mm -hmm. everyday lives, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who, who's, uh, who see rising inequality, uh, a stagnation of their income, uh, a, a kind of uh, erosion of their life opportunities. So I think solving problems for real people, mm -hmm. uh, that is the test for political orders. And uh, we can probably agree on the kind of virtues and values that, that we think might be best if we could bring them into the world. But in, at the end of the day, it's really, can those principles and values be embedded in working institutions that that people find uh, uh, important because they 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 relate to their lives mm -hmm. in real material ways, and so I think there's a test now to 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 see whether there's another era uh, before us uh, for liberal democracies, and and it's it won't be simply won or lost at the level of. Who has the best principles? Hmm. What values do you think you want to preserve? Although I, I do think that's an important debate. It's hmm. also, can you organize socioeconomic space? Mm -hmm. Can you solve 21st century problems? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and those are, are the kind of tests that I think that will determine over the decades to come, what will be the distribution of, of types of political order on the global stage? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, again, thank you very much for that elaboration. Uh, very insightful. Uh, and perhaps some would argue that um, um, some of these um, problems, the rampant inequality, um, social tensions uh, that, yeah, everyday people are suffering in various liberal democracies, right, from various kinds of problems, um, that some of these problems are contradictions that are in, inherent in liberal capitalism, that uh, liberal capitalism might not even have the tools to solve them because those contradictions are inherent in, in the project. Um, and it might even get worse, but you're hopeful. <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm not sure I, 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 I'm... I mean, in terms of the... Uh, in, I do think my, yeah. my theoretical claim as a scholar is that if liberal international order is to have another era, is to, to survive and, yeah. and become a, and remain yeah. at the center of the international system, it will have to deal with these problems. Yeah. It remains an open question whether our societies can do this. Um, I, my only uh, uh, thread of, of optimism is that we've done it before, that mm -hmm. there have been these these reinventions, and, and I've mentioned before the 1930s and 40s, mm -hmm. when <clears throat> I think uh, you see a kind of um, a kind of uh, impasse. Uh, the, the 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 liberal democracies uh, in the face of the Great Depression and the 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 the, the kind of modern uh, developments uh, of the 1930s, the late interwar period, mm -hmm. the rise of alternative forms of of power in, in fascism and totalitarianism, uh, there was a real kind of moment uh, uh, where the question was, can liberal democracies find a pathway forward in this kind of world? And uh, it, it really took two things. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'll just, since we're, we're talking to international relations here, E.H. Uh, yeah. e. Carr, yeah. his 20 years crisis, uh, certainly not a, a liberal, he didn't think there were liberal solutions to liberal problems. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, was he a Marxist? Uh, what, he was a, a, a really a synthetic thinker, but he had mm -hmm. a kind of realist view of power and, and hegemony. Mm -hmm. But he also had this view that the impasse of the 1930s was really caused by two things. One is 
Britain, which had been the kind of hegemon that had uh, supervised uh, the earlier 19th century era of liberalism, which was a very laissez-faire, uh, kind of classical era of liberalism, mm -hmm. that, that uh, two things happened in the interwar period. You lost the hegemon and you lost the model. You didn't have a powerful liberal state to, to, to provide that kind of hegemonic leadership. And you didn't have a model that worked. And so in some ways today, we're at a similar impasse when the US doesn't look as capable as it did as a kind of organizer of liberal order and the liberal model, uh, such as it was brought down to us from the, the 1940s and 50s, the kind of social welfare, uh, welfare or social democratic model, the embedded liberal model, as some mm -hmm. people call it, mm -hmm. has also kind of unraveled. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we're at a, 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 an impasse where we have to ask two questions. Will there be a kind of leadership coalition, a, 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 a hegemonic power formation that can put its power at the service of open, uh, rule-based, progressive, uh, 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 liberal democratic purposes? And can there be a kind of reinvention of the, of the model, of the social contract, of the mm -hmm. social economic system that, that brings liberal internationalism and, uh, uh, and de liberal, uh, liberal democracy into, into our current period? So I think we're at that kind of moment mm -hmm. where a kind of E.H. Carr, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Where, where the structures are, are telling us that we have a lot of work to do. Yeah and perhaps a reinvention of a new form of embedded liberalism and perhaps a new green deal. Uh, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it just seems to me that the, the, the erosion of the welfare state is not going to end, at least not soon. That, that is just how I view it, but I might be wrong and too pessimistic. Um, yeah, but anyway, uh, that, that dis discussion can continue for a long time. Uh, but again, very interesting. Um, last question. Um, uh, before we leave. So um, any advice uh, to our fellow IR students at uh, Malmö University? Well, I, I would just say to our fellow IR students at universities, uh, your university, mine, uh, uh, this is a great time to study international relations. Uh, in some ways, the, 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 the misfortunes of the world are fortunes for IR scholars. When the world is in, at this kind of moment, mm. um, uh, uh, this kind of uh, the world turned upside down when the most basic questions, what are the sources of order? Mm. Can liberal democracy make a comeback? Uh, can capitalism and democracy be reconciled? Can liberal internationalism find a place to plant its flag? Is there a possibility for, for uh, the cooperative organization of the global system or are we destined for for intensification of the problems of anarchy. All these questions are, are now at the front table. We're asking them. We're, we're, we have to go back and read our, our great texts. Yeah. Uh, the classic questions uh, of international relations are back on, on the, the burner, mm. on the front burner. And that's great for us because it means that we are, we are grappling with the first order issues of of, of the day mm. and uh, that that's exciting. And there is a role because a uh, role for young, young IR scholars because um, those in my generation have had a lot to say and, and, and now it's really time for, for uh, the next generation to speak. Uh, there, there's a kind of awareness uh, of uh, that uh, this is a complicated, uh, a dangerous world uh, and it's gonna require a lot of thought and and I would say institutional statecraft. I, I think liberal international statecraft uh, and liberal institutional statecraft to to survive this century. But um, uh, it's a great moment for 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 creative young IR uh, students. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, they will um, heed that advice. Um, and uh, yeah, be eager to engage this world actually and the, the grand questions ahead of us. Uh, so thank you very much for participating in this interview.
Much appreciated. Thank you, John. It's great to be with you. All the best.